Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Antoine Kahn. I currently serve as the Vice Dean of the School of Engineering and Applied Science. And I am delighted to be here uh, today to open this year's Innovation Forum. Uh, now in its 14th year, this forum is a flagship for the School of Engineering, uh, for the School of Engineering and for Princeton University's uh, community more broadly. Uh, this event is hosted every year by the Keller Center for Innovation and Engineering Education in conjunction with the Office of Technology Licensing in the Office of the Dean for Research. This innovation forum celebrates Princeton's innovation landscape. Our world-renowned faculties are experts in teaching and in research, but today we are here to celebrate their ideas and their ideas with commercial application potential. Uh, These events therefore invite faculty and graduate students and postdocs uh, to present these ideas, to share these ideas with you, the audience. Uh, I would like to thank the Keller Center for hosting this event. The Keller Center is housed in the School of Engineering. It focuses on educating leaders for technology-driven society. It also supports innovation in engineering education, and it fosters entrepreneurship and design thinking. The center reaches uh, close to 800 students every semester through its courses and co-curricular programs. And it acts as a center between and, and a node between the activities of the engineering school and the rest of the campus. It also serves as a hub for partnership and interaction with the broader campus community and the innovation ecosystem. My thanks go to the Office of Technology and Licensing which is co-hosting this event, and to the accounting firm WIS, which is part of the Keller Center's Venture Sponsors Program. I would also like to thank the panel of uh, judges who are with us today. This afternoon, you will hear from presenters who will feature technology with commercialization potential from various departments across campus, from geosciences to ecology, and evolutionary biology, as well as Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory. These innovations uh, span a breadth of potential application in a variety of industries, ranging from data linkage across healthcare data sets to canine sociability. I'm very curious to hear about this one. The panel of judges will help determine the allocation of the prizes, which will be awarded to top three entries. Of course, the prize money is valuable, but the larger benefit to, uh, of the forum to the presenters is the opportunity to interact with you all to obtain your feedback on their innovation and to create meaningful connections. While the judges are deliberating, you will have the distinct privilege of hearing from Dr. Zakia Smith-Ellis. Dr. Smith-Ellis currently serves as the New Jersey's Secretary of Higher Education in Governor Murphy's administration, where she is responsible for the policy development and coordination of higher education activities for the state. Her talk today on innovation and opportunity and the future of New Jersey higher education should be a very exciting and interesting one. I hope that you will enjoy what looks to be a wonderful afternoon and a wonderful event. My sincere thanks again to everyone uh, participating in this event and to all those attending, and my best of luck to the presenters. And let me now introduce Professor Margaret Martinosi, the Director of the Keller Center for Innovation in, Engin in Engineering Education. Margaret. So thank you, Antoine, for the introduction, and thank you, Antoine, for representing the School of Engineering. Uh, as he mentioned, I'm Margaret Martinosi. I'm a professor of computer science. I've been here 25 years, and I'm also director of the Keller Center. Uh, Innovation Forum is one of Keller's flagship events. It's one of its oldest events. It basically dates back to when Keller was first formed about 14 years ago. 
Um, it's hosted by the School of Engineering, so we're very grateful for engineering support, as well as the Office of Technology Licensing and uh, Keller itself. Um, Keller serves, as you heard, as a bridge. It was formed to serve as a bridge across this campus. So even though we're housed within the School of Engineering, we reach literally every department on campus. We teach over 1,100 students per year in our classes, and we teach to literally every major on campus. So yes, we're within the engineering school, and we love being in the engineering school, but we really are that bridge across campus that we were mandated from day one to be. Um, we also uh, blend between curricular and co-curricular programs. So yes, we teach 1,100 students a year in 25 traditional courses, but we also have hundreds of students a year flowing through programs like eLab, which is our entrepreneurial accelerator program, Tiger Challenge, which is design thinking for social impact, Princeton Startup Immersion Program, which gets Princeton students out to do internships at startups in New York, Tel Aviv, and uh, our newest location will be Shanghai this summer. So we have a range of both curricular and curricular programs aimed all across campus. Uh, Innovation Forum only happens once per year, but it really shows off the many interconnections and bridges that Keller forms throughout the year. So we'll often see teams that come out of a Princeton Research Lab that do Innovation Forum and then fold themselves into our eLab Accelerator or Incubator programs or other programs, uh, office hours, and other ways to learn the ropes in order to uh, become a successful venture. And we see companies years later uh, that have gone through this process that are now successful ventures, either still freestanding ventures or that have been acquired um, successfully. Uh, Keller is the educational home for entrepreneurship on this campus and is thrilled to be a, uh, playing such a central role in the university's innovation ecosystem. So I wanna take a moment to say thank you to all of the Keller Center team uh, for all that they do to make events like this happen. Uh, it takes an awful lot of organization to pull something like this together, and I really appreciate everyone's team effort. Um, particular thanks to JD for event coordination, to Beth Jarvie for communications, and of course, you will be hearing soon from Cornelia Hillstrong, who uh, shepherds and oversees the management of this forum and is sort of a force in making uh, this and many things around Keller happen, so we're very grateful to all that hard work from those three people as well as the full team. Um, I particularly want to thank the Office of Technology Licensing, which co-hosts the event, and WIS, uh, as Antoine already mentioned, which is part of Keller Center's Venture Sponsors Program. We are particularly thrilled that Matt Barbieri from WIS is returning once again as the event's MC. Uh, some of you might have heard when you walked in that I find this room, it, it's kind of dark, it's underground, there's something about the leather seats. It can sort of suck in some of the energy and the excitement if we're not careful. Um, but I'm confident that the speakers and Matt are gonna blast the energy back out again and, and keep this a lively event, the lively event that it deserves to be. Um, so how do we form the program for today's event? Uh, Cornelia is gonna get into the details of this, but I wanted to give you sort of a high level view. And in particular, we cast the net broadly. Um, if you think that you're in a field that doesn't do entrepreneurship, Keller respectfully disagrees with you, basically. Uh, so we send the emails, we gather presenters from every corner of campus. We send the invitation out to all Princeton faculty, postdoctoral researchers, graduate students, undergraduate students. Um, we reach out to Princeton Plasma Physics Lab. Uh, we basically cover all the divisions. So yes, engineering, yes, the sciences. But if you're a musician with an entrepreneurial idea, um, we wanna hear about that as well. Uh, and we encourage them to share out with all of you some of the research that they, seem, uh, that they feel will have some potential commercial impact. Um, I would like to thank the amazing panel of judges we have with us here today. Each year it's, it's exciting. Um, to see you work with the speakers. I think what many people who have seen this year after year uh, will appreciate is that the prize money is one aspect of this and there's non-trivial prize money at stake. Um, but the other aspect of this is that these teams, these uh, innovators get the chance to get feedback from and work with some really amazing um, skilled expert uh, judges across a wide range of fields. And so we're very grateful for their time and attention in this way. Um, we also are very grateful that at 5.30, while the judges are deliberating, 
Uh, the keynote speaker tonight will be Dr. Zakia Smith-Ellis. She serves within uh, New Jersey State Government as the Secretary of Higher Education. And she's gonna talk about innovation opportunities in that important space. Um, so the breadth of technologies you're gonna hear about today is remarkable. Um, if you have ever wanted extremely precise flow sensing, this is the place to be today. If you have ever wanted to make buildings more intelligent and energy efficient, this is the place to be today. And if you have ever wondered, as I did this morning when my dog was like staring at me like this at 6 a.m., if you ever wondered about your dog's personality, this is also the place to be today. Um, the scientists that make these presentations today are gonna be from undergraduates to graduate students, postdocs, faculty and research staff, and so forth. That's a tremendous range. And so I hope you'll enjoy the range of topics, the range of speakers. I wanna reiterate my thanks to everyone who's participating and attending. And with this, I pass it over to Cornelia Hulstrunk, who will give the judge introductions and also a bit more process details so you know what's going on as we, as we go. But for now, thank you very much. All right, well thank you so much, Margaret, for those uh, introductory comments and welcome everyone. It's fabulous to see you all here for the 14th Annual Innovation Forum. We do need to keep the energy up, so I hope to see some audience engagement um, as, we, as we progress. My name is Cornelia Holstrunk and I'm the Executive Director of the Keller Center. Today you have nine terrific teams that you will be meeting with and hearing from. So let me tell you a little bit about the flow of today's uh, event. Every team will have three minutes to provide a pitch, and this will be followed by seven minutes of Q&A from our judging panel. At this juncture, we're only going to allow the judges to ask questions. However, if you are burning with a question, don't worry. There will be an opportunity for you to engage with all of the speakers outside of those two back doors at 4.30. That's when the demo station and the reception, networking reception begins. So we encourage you please to, to do that and participate. At 5.30, we will all reconvene back in this space, and our keynote speaker will be giving her talk at that time. That will be followed at 6 p.m. by the award ceremony. So if you're really curious to see which of these innovations actually will end up winning, please join us for that. We expect all of the participants to stick around, obviously, because you might be one of the winners, and then to come up on stage if you are called, ideally with your entire team, so that we can take uh, photos. So I want to make sure that we, um, we get some nice uh, pictures of you. Now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce you to our judges. I'm incredibly excited uh, to introduce you to them, because I think they're just phenomenal. So first up, we have Deborah Hoover. Um, Deb, if you could just wave and so people could see you. Deb is the president and CEO of the Burton D. Morgan Foundation, which is Northeast Ohio's philanthropic champion of the entrepreneurial spirit. Morgan Foundation seeks to build the entrepreneurial mindset in students through educational and experiential opportunities that target problem solving and innovation skills. So a big thank you to Deb for joining us. Thank you, Deb. <laughs> Daryl, uh, Daryl Penn, uh, class of 1999 graduate uh, grad of Princeton, is a director of corporate development with pharmaceutical and vaccine manufacturer Merck. Um, his work there largely centers around exploring disruptive approaches to healthcare that will improve the discovery, development, approval, and commercialization of its products. Thank you, Daryl. <laughs> Jake, Jake Leslie. Class of 1988, Jake serves as the President and Chief Executive Officer of Ingenuity Systems, uh, or did serve in that capacity from 1999 till 2013 when it was acquired by Quiagen. He currently is advising and consulting with early stage companies in a variety of sectors and he's been a huge supporter of Keller. Thank you so much, Jake. <laughs> All right, Isa, Isa D. Watson is the founder and CEO of Squad by Invested, uh, which is a data-driven software company which is revolutionizing how people create meaningful connections. She has had many prior careers to this and we learned a lot about it over lunch and it's an amazing, amazing, amazing person. Um, prior to founding Squad, she was the Vice President of Digital Strategy at JP Morgan Chase, and before that. 
She worked at Pfizer as a research chemist, which is her field of training, and a clinical trial strategy analyst. Thank you so much, Isa, for joining us. <laughs> We're also joined by Paul Chamberlain. Uh, hey, everyone. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> Paul is class of 85. Um, he's an early stage investor and advisor to senior executives in emerging technology companies. This semester, we're extremely lucky to have you here on campus, serving as the James Way Visiting Professor in Entrepreneurship, teaching a hugely popular class called Special Topics in Entrepreneurship, Entrepreneurship in the Digital Age. Thank you, Paul, for being here. So in case you're wondering how the judges will go about deliberating across these various industries and various presentations, I thought I would share with you the judging criteria. So these are the judging criteria that they're looking at. First, the idea. How novel is it? Is there a competitive advantage? What's the IP status of the idea? Secondly, the value proposition. What's the market size that this innovation is trying to address? Is there a particular need for the idea or the innovation? Thirdly, possible mes mechanisms to actually generate revenue or to provide social good. They're also looking at risks and challenges. What are some key risks and challenges? in taking this idea from the lab out into the marketplace? What sorts of milestones or budgets have the entrepreneurs identified? And finally, what's the quality of the overall presentation? So they, they will have their work cut out for them, I'm sure. So before I leave, I just want to also uh, express some thanks to a few folks. I'd like to start off first with a thank you to, to WIS um, for their continued support and, and to Matt specifically. I also want to thank uh, the Office of Technology and Licensing, and I'd like to call out uh, the staff there that has been so helpful to us over many, many years in putting this event together. So a big thank you to John Ritter, to Lori Zodikoff, Tony Williams, Chris Wright, and Linda Jan. Uh, just a quick round of applause for them. <laughs> also a big, big thank you to the KC team, JD specifically, but the broader team as well, and also the CS Communications team, which I know put a lot of effort um, in, in making today happen. So at this juncture, best of luck to the presenters, and I'd like to pass it over to our MC, Matt. Thank you. Thank you. Ooh. Thank you, Cornelia. Does this work? I can't really hear. Now that the pressure's on, I understand I have to keep the energy high. Uh, so I appreciate the opportunity to be the MC for the 14th annual Innovation Forum. This is probably my, I was going back in time, sixth year doing this, and uh, it's gotten more exciting every year. I love the relationship that we have formed with Keller. I'm very appreciative of the opportunity to do this again. And so I think that the best way I can keep the room energized is by being extremely brief in my commentary. So without further ado, I believe we should start with the first presenter, who is Michael Jamison, that will be educating us on secure data linkage across private healthcare data sets. Okay. Hi. My name is Michael Jimison. I'm the founder of Cyberscape and a PhD candidate in mathematics. Cyberscape is building an AI platform to analyze sensitive healthcare data sets. AI in healthcare is currently a $1.3 billion market, increasing clinical and as well as consumer data together with the rise of powerful deep, deep learning models in conjunction with payers pushing providers to cut costs by optimizing their, their use of resources has analysts predicting high double-digit year-over-year growth. However, there is a fundamental conflict between AI and healthcare. AI models require access to large amounts of training data, but access to healthcare data is highly regulated. Healthcare sees the highest number of data breaches of, 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 of any sector, as well as the most expensive breaches with losses coming in at over $400 per patient record breached. This makes data sharing a risky proposition. At Cyberscape, we have developed privacy preserving software, which conducts private data linkage across multiple healthcare data sets, orders of magnitude, more efficiently than pre-existing protocols. 
conventional data privacy methods mask data as to protect patient identities. These methods both lower the quality of the data and are vulnerable to re-identification uh, attacks. Our methods, on the other hand, grant mathematically provable privacy guarantees, decreasing risk for patients, data contributors, and for ourselves. We never deteriorate the quality of the data, meaning more powerful uh, 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 sorry, uh, analyses, there we go. And we never even uh, transfer private data, meaning less involved IRB uh, approval processes. Adverse drug reactions, A, A, ADRs uh, cost the US healthcare system over $136 billion every year and account for 100,000 deaths annually. However, less than 1% of adverse e events are, are, are reported to the FDA. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Um, we're now setting aside seven minutes for the judging panel to ask questions. So if you want to raise your hand, you have a mic there. Or you want me to deliver it? So, Michael, yeah. great presentation. Thank I you. Okay. What did we miss? Okay, yeah. So, okay. Okay, great. So, um, so, um, Less than 1% of all ADRs are actually reported to the FDA. Um, however, direct uh, analysis of medical records has, has been shown to boost detection of adverse e events. Our, our technology um, could allow an insurer to directly analyze medical records to both minimize uh, costs and to optimize patient, patient outcomes. Um, many ADRs are strongly linked with, with, with uh, genes, um, and our, tech, our technology could be used to uh, safely link um, that type of data with, uh, with uh, medical records as to uh, more deeply inform uh, risk. And lastly, um, we need to um, continue testing on, on synthetic uh, data, um, and full-scale tests will, will consume around $400 in cloud computing resources per test, and so, and so any winnings from this contest will will go towards those resources. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Great question. <laughs> uh, thank you, that was, um, that was great. It, it's a super exciting opportunity. If I understand it right, the idea is to collect very large data sets, do analytics, and get some insights from that. That's right. So when you're collecting these data sets, even if they are anonymized, mm -hmm. what are the IP consideration and sort of the, the rights consideration to get access to these data sets? Do you have the rights to actually use them for whatever purpose you want, or how does that work? Right, so uh, that's something uh, I think that we'll have to work out um, with the actual uh, owners of of, of the data. Um, how I envision this, this system working um, is each data set owner, they will, they will essentially keep their data locally, um, and we will send questions to their data, right? And so we never actually like, see what they're holding. All that we uh, get out is simply the output um, of a query that was posed, right? So we don't actually own any of uh, the data. We, 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 we could have some rights to the outputs, um, and that's something that, um, that we'll have to sort out. Um, your material, you mentioned some possible connections to um, commercial DNA testing. Ah, right. Mm -hmm. Yes, right. Yes, um, so let's talk about, um, 
let's, let's talk about the Fitbit um, part first, right? Um, so actually right now, uh, Fitbit um, is working with the FDA um, in, a, in a trial process uh, where, um, where uh, Fitbit is seeking some type of market uh, approval um, and, and basically the like, deal is uh, Fitbit can um, put out their uh, service um, with, with, with somewhat um, limited um, data um, uh, showing uh, the efficacy of their service, but, but they um, have to uh, promise to to generate real-world evidence showing how their service works, right? And so where our um, service comes in is that we could use, right, data that has been generated by, by these, like, Fitbits, right? And um, we could link this data uh, with some outcomes data um, that comes from insurance claims records uh, or from medical records to, to mine for correlations between changes and patterns in, in or, or that have been measured by these Fitbits um, and, and like medical outcomes. Um, so in terms, of, um, in terms of linking this data with, with some data on, on, on uh, genes, um, like I, Kind of got into it a little bit um, with the uh, adverse uh, drug e e events. Uh, some of these e e e e events are strongly linked with uh, genes. Um, so um, there's some e e events that basically never happen unless someone is carrying a certain gene, um, and 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 combining a large data set. Of, of genes and linking that across a large set of medical records could find like new correlations linking uh, genes and medical outcomes. I think we have one quick question. Sort of asking it for a while. Quick question. Yes. Um, so uh, interoperability is certainly a hot topic. That's right. right. Now. Um, let me ask you some more of a theoretical question. Yes. Who do you think owns the data? Is it yes. the uh, the institutions, is yes. it the individual? Um, sort no. Of does... So, I mean, legally, the actual institution owns, 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 owns that data. Morally, um, you could say that the that the actual person um, should have some right to some payment, uh, possibly. Um, I think um, it's actually more ethical um, to take a view where. Uh, we want to use all of the data present at that institution, and um, and that's because people who are more likely to 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 give their consent to to have their data used or to be paid are they they are more likely to be highly educated and and they're less likely to be uh, to be from a minority background, and that means that if we just say, okay, everyone, you choose what you want to do personally with your data, we will wind up with very skewed data sets, and that's why I think it's extremely important to have a robust privacy system where we minimize the risk of having data leakage if, if we will subject everyone's data to, to being used for purposes of uh, science. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, never easy to be the first one. So we appreciate you uh, biting the bullet and coming up first as a presenter. Uh, we're going to be switching gears and now hearing from Johan Carlson about a plasma contact microphone for structural health monitoring. All right, so I'm Johan Karlsson, and I will be talking about an invention that I was working on when I was a staff member at the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory. 
So it's a plasma contact microphone. So it's a device that uses plasma, which is a gas that we pull electric current through, to, uh, uh, to uh, convert uh, acoustic waves propagating in solids into electronic signals. And the primary application is structural head monitoring, which means that we are keeping an eye on the structural integrity of infrastructure con uh, continuously and in real time. And why is that useful? Because uh, basically in all developed economies, public infrastructure is crumbling. Uh, you, in the US alone, the deferred maintenance is now $4 trillion. It's a huge problem. Uh, so structural health monitoring, or SHM for short, can help prioritize maintenance and uh, keep our commute safe. One of the major SHM techniques is acoustic emission sensing, which takes advantage of the fact that as metals fatigue and weaken under cyclic load, they form internal microfractures. And as you can see in this photo from the surface, this process is virtually invisible. But as these small cracks form, the stress energy is released in the form of a high-pitched noise or acoustic emission, which is way into the ultrasonic frequency range. So if you put sensors for these AEs on infrastructure, you can pick up this process and you can use it to predict structural failure. Uh, existing piezoelectric AO sensors have some limitations. There's a trade-off between uh, sensitivity and signal distortion. They don't like extreme temperatures, and they're very uh, sensitive to neutral radiation. So uh, my invention uses the plasma in a gas discharge tube as a transducer. And please come see me after all the presentations. I'll give you details and even a demo. Uh, it has simultaneously high sensitivity and low signal distortion. It's also much tougher than the piezoelectric crystals, both in terms of the temperature operating range and especially in terms of uh, resilience to neutral radiation. So an example application would be acoustic emission sensing in a spent nuclear fuel pool, like you see on the right. So the plasma contact microphone could be a permanent sensor installed here, whereas existing technology must be replaced every few days, which is very impractical. Uh, status. A full patent filing was done 19 days ago. Uh, SPR proposal to commercialize this patent was uh, submitted actually like 41 hours ago. <laughs> uh, I'm talking to uh, investors and licensees. Uh, so in terms of the market, I think initially the obvious thing is this corner of the existing market, which is Extreme temperatures and radiation are limiting A sensing, making, making it impractical or even impossible. That would be the first void to go after because the technology basically sells itself. And I talk to people in the industry and they agree with this. I think longer term, the really interesting thing would be this much bigger market, which is the, the mass market of transportation infrastructure, going back to the crumbling bridge we saw in the beginning. And this is much more a question of it's not so much technological limitations that prevents A sensing from being done on a massive scale now. It's much more the lack of a sophisticated uh, 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 business model for this, that the established players don't want to go, go after this, this mass market because profit margins are presumably too high in this, in this niche market they currently occupy. Thank you very much, Johan. I think we're going to open it up to the judges. So, Johan, let me just ask the first question. Yes. What is it about your background which makes you uniquely well suited to pursue this opportunity? Well, technology-wise, of course, it's plasma-based, so <laughs> that's, that's my PhD. And I think more recently, I think I've always been kind of a generalist, and I've been at this for like two years now, so I think I've been you know, on the learning curve, and I think I'm starting to be, learn. Also. And also, I've been talking to people now in the AE sensing business. We have a potential licensee that I've been working with, actually. So I think I'm also becoming a little bit getting some insider knowledge, and I'm starting to figure out you know, how the existing market works. So I think probably those two together, the fact that I have the technical expertise. I came up with this thing and I built it. Uh, and also I'm beginning to get a little bit more up to speed on you know, how the markets work. Hey. And I've, there's a good community here. So I'm, there's people I'm talking to and I'm learning a lot from. People who are mentoring me, so. Hey, Johan. Hey. Good job. Thank you. Um, can you explain to me the process of if you have the sensor in like a crack, right, in some minute, in, from transportation, right? Right, in the sure. ground or in streets or right. whatever, and you identify that there's like a crack emerging, mm -hmm. what actually happens? Like, do you have some kind of position of if we fix it and we first find it, this is like the savings? Like, what exactly, and we can fix it? Like, 
tell me how that was the process of the sensing and the detection and the problem solving there. Okay, so the process is, the, uh, and I will show more, I have a poster uh, at the demo station. But, but the, the thing is that this is like gives early notice and you kind of can't just count the number of acoustic emissions you get. And the number will go up and up and up and then it will roll over and start decreasing. And that's when the red light should be going off because then things are about to collapse. That means that it has been weakened. So it's basically just crack, you can track the number, you make a fit. And as long as the number of acoustic emissions go up, you're okay, but once they level off or even start dropping, then you know you need to fix this. Yeah, but if you're applying it to like the transportation, you know, can, can you go back to your first slide? Yeah. You were trying, if you're like deferred maintenance, right? So it's like right. a lot of cracks, so, you know, everywhere in transportation infrastructure. Right. So like, is it? Do you have to build like a sensing ecosystem, like a monitoring ecosystem around this for people to be deployed to go fix uh, this? Ultimately, that's how I see it. And again, this should really be, because now it's very, very technical. I enjoy it. You know, I meet these, you know, the companies I talk to, the VPs have screwdrivers in their, in their drawers, and they're disassembling, you know, sensors together and talking impedance matching. So I think that's the market. So I think it's a little bit like early on with computers, that these are the mainframe makers. They, they don't in, they're not interested in personal computers because the margins are much lower. So it's, it's a very high entry to, to, to get into this market and also to get a solution you can actually, you shouldn't have to have an electrical engineering degree to understand the offering. So I think what you would want to do is really, you would want to sell a service. This should be a subscription service. You know, they, they download an app, you know, they hand over the credit card, they sign up, and then you'll do structural health monitoring of their bridge for like a year, and the guy will come out and install the sensor for them, and there will be an app to notify them if there's a problem. So I think that's completely missing from the market. And technology for that is there. That doesn't require any breakthroughs. It's just for someone to, go after that mass market with much lower profit margins. So let me take you all the way back to the beginning here for a second. So it's sort of a twofold question. The first one is mm -hmm. you've got a beachhead market, which is those extreme temperatures. Yes. Give me the back of the envelope math on that market. How big is it? Who are the buyers? Right. How much money can you make? And also, what is your time frame from right. getting from today Right. to getting to that beachhead market yeah. and how much money do you yeah. have to invest? So I, I just did a commercialization plan for this SBIR together with one of the leading companies. And they are saying that starting in the year 2033, this will be a, thousand, uh, a million dollar market. They will, take, they will sell a thousand of these sensors for at least a thousand dollars each. And then they expect 15% growth. So at the end of the 10 year period, it was like a four or five million dollar market. So it's not a very large market. So I mean, you could build a profitable business, but it would be a handful of people doing this, or you could do licensing and stuff. So it's just having worked on this. I mean, I started from the technology side trying to understand the market. Even the whole existing market for acoustic emission sensing is really only. They call it more asset protection. So it's more if you have a piece of infrastructure that's very, very valuable, billions of dollars, and it generates revenue, that's when they do this. If you have a decrepit bridge, this doesn't make any money. So that's why there's, it's harder to budget, I guess, these very expensive AE sensing solutions which are, which are available right now. And there's just no interest to go after that, but it's, it's a different market. Uh, so the, the interesting, the most interesting thing so I would start here. This is a no-brainer. You know, when I meet these people, I start presenting, and it's, you had me at hello. You, they, don't, they, they get it immediately, and they say, build a prototype. We can sell these tomorrow. There's a huge need for it. And they don't want to send you know, divers in to spend fuel pools to replace sensors. So it's, it's an obvious value proposition there. But agreed, it's a limited market. You can fill that market, and you can, you know. But to move on, again, there's $4 trillion of deferred maintenance. And if you had a budget for, for, for doing maintenance or, or replacement, I mean, 1% of, of, the, of the cost you know, to get yeah. good data to make rational decision, what needs to go first, and then you have a 40 billion market right yeah. there. So I was just trying to get a sense of the time to get to that beachhead market and the cost of you to get there. I think it would, again, be once you can be profitable, once you have a profitable business, you have revenue, you're profitable. No, no, I'm talking about the beachhead, like your proof the, of concept the beachhead, that this I think works, you could, that it works I'm hoping you could move out of here in about two years. To the red circle. Yes, then you could start going after this larger market. You do yeah. the market research and all of that stuff. So I am, I'm, I'm being vague. How long will it take you and how much will it cost you to be able to take advantage of the red circle? 
that's happening. That's right now. very close. That that we will, you know, that will be that will be field testing next year. Next year. Yes. And how much money do you need to get to that point? I, I mean, I have a pending proposal now for a phase one, two hundred thousand. Okay. That will take us to prototype and field testing. And if we don't get that grant, that might be a subcontract or something else. But we will know, like mid-May, we'll hear about uh, the SBIR. But it's not an enormous amount of funding. So I think it's on, probably on that order, 200,000. OK, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. That's all. I'm sorry. <laughs> OK. If you can get it in in four seconds, we're. <laughs> what does it look like out in the field from that slide where there's a two? So how does that translate to like, the I have a device I can demo, but it's small. I mean, it's the size of a 9-volt battery, basically. And then depending, either you have a coaxial cable to collect the data, or you could have a small microprocessor and, and an RF module. But it would be something not bigger than a stack of cards uh, that would be attached to the bridge. You could, you know, with metal or even, you might even be able to actually put it into wet concrete for new construction. So a couple of those on a bridge would, would do it. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much, John. Well done. Up next, we'll be hearing from Andre Kodak uh, about a non-intrusive, non-spoofable thermal flow meter. Uh, hello, my name is Andre Kodak. Uh, I'm from Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory, and I will be talking about non-intrusive, non-spoofable thermal flow meter. Imagine that uh, you uh, want to check whether you have a gas leak in your house. Or uh, imagine you want to prevent somebody to develop a weapons-grade uranium. Uh, in both of these situations, you need to measure accurately the flow of gas. And in both of these situations, you don't want to mess with the plumbing. So you want something like this, which can open and uh, be put on existing uh, uh, circuit. So this is the, uh, where this new technology comes from. This is the uh, uh, part of the growing market uh, uh, in the flow meters, and it has a lot of applications, may have a lot of potential application in leak detection and pipelines and uh, in chemical production. Uh, there are already existing uh, devices like this uh, to measure water, for example. This you can buy at Lowe's. Uh, but uh, the, this technology uh, is working very poorly with gases. So you cannot put it on your gas line. So in the new technology, you, you put the uh, small amount of heat in one place and remove small amount of heat in another place, like you have heater and cooler. And uh, you basically use the ability of the gas to uh, remove the heat fr from the... Uh, from the pipe. So you basically measure temperature difference between heating and cooling region, and this gives you a rather accurate indication of the velocity of the flow and, and the flow rate. So you uh, have uh, in this device increased accuracy in non-invasive technology, and the device is rather simple. It has uh, uh, very uh, uh, off-the-shelf, mostly, parts. The other advantage is we have uh, thermoelectric elements, which are heaters and coolers. So if someone wants to prevent you from accurately measured, try to change the temperature of the, of the gas, for example, somewhere upstream. Uh, you also cannot avoid this because you're measuring the temperature difference. So we have uh, the uh, low-cost design. We actually, uh, the, there is a prototype of this design 
uh, built for non-nuclear uh, non-proliferation purposes in Los Alamos National Laboratory. And uh, we have a patent pending uh, devices low cost, uh, most of the components are of the shelf. And uh, we plan if we get some uh, additional uh, funding from this innovation forum, we plan to use it to demonstrate operation in different fluids and gases, and also we have some ideas of improving this prototype. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much, Andre. Hey, Andre. So much for the presentation. Um, you mentioned uh, one of the benefits is that the uh, device is simple in its design. How, how is it that you are protecting um, the, the, the intellectual property and in, in sort of what you've created and in, in, in sort of the, the design elements? Are there anything that's sort of proprietary or unique to the, uh, to the instrument itself that, uh, that you're looking to, pre to, to preserve? Uh, yes, the, this uh, device uh, is actually uh, as I said, we have a patent pe pending, so unique ability of this device is that we are uh, uh, basically <coughs> measuring the temp uh, how efficiently can this pipe remove the heat from the heater. Uh, th this, uh, this is never uh, was done before and this is protected. So I'm not a patent expert, but is that sort of like a method of use type of protection or is there actual technology in in the device itself that uh, the, uh, thank you yeah I would say it's method of use because uh, there are no unique uh, parts or the parts are of the shell or, or everything you can buy uh, if not in Home Depot but on Amazon yes <laughs> hey Andrea um, Say you turn this into a business. In your first year of commercialization, who were your biggest customers? Like, what types of companies are your biggest customers? So, uh, right now, uh, uh, we already have a customer, but it's a... Uh, it's, uh, uh, what it's types a of International companies? Atomic Agency. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, this is... Uh, but uh, the biggest customer would be the... Uh, the cons uh, the residential, uh, like, uh, for example, people who want to snap this thing on their gas pipe and, and uh, be uh, sure that no gas is leaking anywhere. And uh, they have what, what gas comes in, uh, this will come out at, at the end where you, when you're using and not anything is lost in between. Thank you. Uh, the uh, the strategy is the uh, that it's a low cost device. Uh, it it's uh, it will be uh, it should it should be uh, like it non invasive. So basically, everyone uh, uh, can snap it on, and uh, uh, the. Yes, and uh, the other effect that uh, any, anyone wants to have some redundant uh, control uh, of, of the system. Andre, tell us about flow monitoring right now. How is it done for gases? And what sort of uh, value proposition are you going to be able to deliver? Will it be you know, uh, 10 times the performance at one-tenth the cost? How do you think about it relative to existing um, applications. Uh, so uh, all existing applications for gases are invasive, uh, mostly. So uh, so basically, you need to cut your right. plumbing. You need to put it in, and uh, then there are like it's a very old traditional technology and uh, it measures everything rather accurately. But um, the problem is that when you have existing uh, pipe or you want to 
inspect something and you basically uh, uh, don't have access. Or uh, if you want to measure gas which is chemically active or at high temperature, uh, then uh, it's, a, it's a very big opportunity because uh, you're, uh, here you are not con in contact with the gas. You, you basically, the pipe takes care of it. But the fact that you're heating and cooling within a relatively short period of time is not going to lead to any catastrophic failure. It, it's a very, uh, uh, the temperature difference, I think it's on this, it's like about 20 degrees uh, uh, plus minus. Uh, uh, so it's, it's not, for most purposes, it is not affecting very much the, uh, like this. I'll sleep better, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> So Andre, I got a question. So you talk about a direct to consumer model that is based on sort of a secondary monitoring, which is you have your primary monitoring on the fan, on your, your gas pipes, and then you want this for some ex, you know, extraordinary circumstance. You might have a leak or whatever. Is there an opportunity for this to become the de facto standard in the first place? In other words, 10 years from now, this is what they do instead of invasive technology? Uh, yes, it's possible because it, it, uh, it's cheaper. And uh, it eliminates, uh, for example, uh, I remember I lived in a house where the, the gas meter outside, it's, it's actually smelled gas, and I, I actually called the service and said, okay, they normally don't care about outside. They so think it will not blow up. So. That's the opportunity, in other words, like if this would become the standard for all gas monitoring in residential homes? It's, it's, it's possible. I, I, yeah, it's a good opportunity to explore, but this, this should work. Yes. That would be great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of holes. Jake, Andre would be happy to sign you up to go after that. All right, for part yeah. of Okay, thank you very much, Andre. Thank you. We're going to change the time a little bit. Okay. Up next, we're going to hear from Bridget Von Holt uh, on a simple genetic assay of mutations associated with hypersocial behavior in domestic dogs. I was expecting a prop. A dog? Yep. I know. <laughs> I left my dog at home. Um, hi, my name is Bridget Von Holt. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. I want you to look at this image and just imagine which of these canines might be more successful as a service dog. And if you're going to ask my opinion, I'll say the one on the right. There are clear behavioral differences between dogs and wolves. My team has discovered that there are four genes that increase social behavior, and they're unique to dogs. Although many dogs are trainable, disposition may not be. Let's just focus on service dogs. We know that they must have a specific temperament. They must have this incredible desire to be with you and interact with you. We also know that training a service dog can be very expensive, both in time and money. Often the specialized training costs up to $30,000 per dog. Yet with all that training, they see about a 70% failure rate of dogs in training programs. Most of this is due to behavioral problems. If we can have, um, to avoid this uh, loss of investment, an early detection method would be really greatly needed. Um, really greatly needed. Just to give you a sense of where this might benefit, every year there's about half a million service dogs active in the United States. Right now they're currently using two behavioral assessments. They predominantly, these assessments, predominantly measure um, the aggression level and the reactivity level of a service dog or of dogs in general. The two tests here, one's called SAFER, one's called Assessipet, both of these measures often don't give consistent results with each other and across dogs. Further, um, the level uh, of aggression that these tests measure don't reflect the amount of sociability or social behavior these dogs can display. What we really want to focus on something is that uh, focus on something that doesn't change with behavior, and that's the genetic component. So what my team has done is just, uh, developed a non-invasive genetic test 
that measures friendliness, and it can be completed on a dog at any age in any environment. Oops, sorry, I forgot to mention another aspect here. The behavioral assessment um, tests are highly influenced by the age of the animal and its environment, whereas genetics are not. This is a consistent feature of dogs over time. So having this non-invasive genetic test can give us a sense of how many friendliness um, genes each dog may carry in its DNA. And it's a very simple association. The more number of genes that a dog carries, the greater propensity for social behavior. Now, this kind of test might become really useful, let's say, if you're investing in training a service dog. This genetic test does not rely upon the need to acclimate a dog to a new home or for it to mature into an adult. I, um, for about $25 a dog, this genetic test takes about two days to go from the sampling of a dog to me in my lab generating a personalized report. I have a provisional patent right now. I've been working um, in the design phase with a company called Neogen. Neogen uh, provides many genetic testing kits to the canine breeding community already, so this could very easily be wrapped up into one of their commercial kits. I'm also working with uh, Guardian Angels, which is a medical service dog company where they breed and train their own service dogs. So this is a genetic test, the first of its kind, and it really um, is a huge advancement over the behavioral assessments that are currently in place. And if this pitch is successful, I hope to continue to expand on this pilot study that involves both Nijin and the Guardian Angels. Thank you for your time. Thank you. So I can take any questions. So if a yes. Yes, right. What happens to that animal? Right, so this is a really great question for many aspects. One thing that we do know is that these friendliness genes are not fixed in a breed. So we know that there are a couple types of breeds commonly used for service dogs, um, and not all individuals of the same breed have the same genotype or the same genetic composition. What breeders already do are use traits in order to breed certain dogs. So in this case, if a dog comes out to not carry many or any of these genes for friendliness, it may be a dog that's just immediately adopted out, which is what happens to these service dogs that fail programs anyways. So they would make for a really great family pet. They just may not have the right combination of training and the genetics to support a service dog career. Yes. 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 So be used in conjunction with the behavioral assessments or will completely replace the behavioral assessments? So the behavioral assessments are often really informative for the type of um, negative behaviors of dogs, right? So you want to avoid an aggressive dog or one that's highly reactive. Um, a lot of those behaviors can't be trained out. Whether those behavioral assessments are informative in some, some situations, I believe that's entirely true. For breeders who already have many lines of dogs that are consistently producing puppies that go into training programs, it will probably help them with the subtleties between this female produces 20% of her puppies that are successful where another female might produce a higher frequency and then to pinpoint those. So it, many of the service dog companies may not be using the aggressive um, assessment, but it's often in place. What I wasn't able to tell you about are shelters where that's a really important location where aggression needs to be noted. When we can do a genetic test in combination with that, it might give us more information that's just not there. So you would be adding costs to the breeding, the canine breeding community. So it would be like a, your a test would be like an additional cost for, for this them. test. Yeah. Yeah, yes. Well, I mean, someone has to be trained to administer the behavioral test. So either a veterinary or a veterinary tech or someone who has a professional ability to watch yeah. the behavior and note it. This doesn't require any subjectivity. You take a little bit of cheek cell from a dog, you can get a result, and that gives you information without having to interpret, is this dog overly or overly responsive to something? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Right, prior to any behavior. Right. Right. You, yes. Right. 
you can help, right, narrow down, perhaps dro drop that um, failure rate into having an increased success. So the cost really comes that they might have a much higher yield. Right. Instead of losing 50 to 70 percent of the dogs in the program, it might be dropped down to 40 percent or 30 percent, depending upon how frequently this is used and in conjunction with whatever tests. Many service programs already have their own training program, and they fail dogs because of various reasons. This might be a really nice connection to help identify which puppies from a litter should even enter in the program, given the, the success of those that do and, and their genetics. Yes, it would be all puppies born to help give you a sense prior to any behavior that needs to occur. You can already get a sense of what's the potential for this animal to respond in the way that you want. Yes. The market would also be for, I mean, I've genotyped my dog. Um, all my friends have had me genotype their dogs. <laughs> I'm working with shelters, too, to help give them some additional information because shelters often lack any information on a dog that might tell you about its propensity for certain behaviors. And then um, also, I got my dog from a companion line breeder. So just as a service dog breeder would breed a dog for a certain purpose, a companion line breeder does the same thing. And this could be an additional trait that they use to say we need to increase the, gen the genetics of this line, even though we know that the behavior is a target. Yes? So Bridget, I'm yes. thinking about 23andMe for dogs. Uh-huh, right? yes. Comes to Absolutely. Why couldn't I take your technology or your process and take a saliva sample from my own dog and then send it into your lab uh -huh. and presumably get the results. So there's, yep. there's nothing that requires you to go through the, the veterinarian you know, channel to do this, right? Except my own sanity in my career. <laughs> I, my lab is not going to function as the testing facility. So having the license out there for some company to wrap this into their already existing test, exactly like you said. The, the vision that I have is that this would be, this is a very cheap assay to run, and to fit it into a new platform would be very easy. And whether or not there's interest from certain companies is really what we're assessing. But yes, the 23andMe, um, Embark is one giant one out of Cornell. A friend of mine is one of the founders of that. They, they have genetic tests for all sorts of traits and features. And this is one of those ideas that could just kind of, kind of slot in there. So back to Jake's question, I keep thinking yes. about the alignment of who you charge for this service versus the value you're creating. So the value in the near term is these service organizations that are training dogs that have, you know, that, that have a high failure rate, and you're re reducing that failure rate by, right. you know, improving the, the population that kind of goes through the training. How do you figure out how to charge them for the service? Because they're the ones that are capturing the value. Right. Okay. I, I think I, I'm going to try to address this. Um, at the moment, right now, Guardian Angels is getting all of their dogs genotyped by me for free. And because this is a really affordable test, this is something that could be carried on through the pilot study. At a larger scale, there are many reasons that people will go to a company for a commercial kit anyways. Much of it might be focused on disease genetics um, and some other trait genetics. So in that case, it would still be a part of that normal cost for that kit. So if they're spending $100, then they're going to have their dog genotyped for maybe 50 or so genetic tests. Um, I know there are other companies that offer a single genetic test, and they can be as affordable as $20, $30, $40 for just one genetic marker, uh, as is this case. So I agree that whether or not um, how it's bundled by a company I think is really important. And I have to say, um, I really think that a lot of people want to know this about their dogs. My friend, like I said, my friends, my family, the friends of my family, <laughs> my students, their parents, everyone wants to know, even though they've already been with their dog for anywhere from two to 12 years, knowing something about this, about their dog's genetics, I think is really enlightening and really fun. Um, so I feel so I guess I don't it's, understand that. yeah. Yes. By, by year 12, yes. the, the aggressiveness has not manifested. Oh, this is not about aggression? I'm going to just like, interrupt you. This is not an aggression test. I see. Friendly test? Yes, this is a okay. friendly okay. test. Those are not whatever, mutually whatever exclusive. Yeah. Whatever phenotype it's measuring or yes. predicting mm -hmm. should have manifested by year 2 or 12. So why run the test? 
Well, so this is meant to give you information when you don't have that. So, so, so well, I've had my dog for 12 years, but whether or not she, or I've had my dog for two and a half, but whether if I've had my hypothetical dog for 12 years, yeah. me as a geneticist, I find it really interesting right. when I do find a matchup between behavior and genetics. Right. So most people, we've noted very interesting trends in terms of genetics. In the case where you don't know this, you can't have your dog for 12 years, right. but you're investing $30,000 in need of a dog, then as someone breeding that, I would want to make sure that I can select them with a higher chance of success. Um, and, and shelters, I think, are another one. And again, to clarify, aggression and, and friendliness are not mutually exclusive. So tests often measure for aggression because that's the most um, impactful on the community, but friendliness is still beneficial in other aspects. In this case, it would be success rate and how friendly and how capable is that dog for creating this intense social bond and desire to interact with you is a really needed feature for a service dog. You should never underestimate the willingness to take the dog. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Bridget. Thank you. Next time the dog. <laughs> Our next presenter uh, is the company Iris. We'll be hearing from Victor Sharpens here um, about providing energy savings in buildings and comfort for occupants efficiently and economically. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks for being here. Yeah, so Sharpens is like carpenter, but sounding really French. Uh, yeah. Uh, so this is like part of uh, my research uh, at, at Princeton, what came out of, of my research. So. Uh, let me grab the. So today I'm going to talk about uh, shading systems. Um, so whether you're in uh, Texas or in uh, Juneau, Alaska, you have very different uh, energy uh, inputs into your buildings. But yet we still expect uh, more or less constant uh, comfort. You know, uh, even further, we expect a certain temperature uh, to be set in every building, homes, offices. But uh, daylight is going to be a factor that is going to vary a lot uh, in these buildings. And you know, we, we hate to have reflections on our screens when we work, uh, yet we get uh, depressed seasonally when we don't have enough daylight. Um, so uh, shading, uh, you know, daylight comes from uh, windows, uh, and windows are bad at insulation, great for comfort. Um, shading helps with uh, providing insulation, but can sometimes decrease the amount of daylight you're getting through your windows. So what we propose uh, is a shading system uh, that uh, makes uh, providing a visual comfort a priority. And the way we do that is we look at how plants deal with uh, sun in nature. And so in plants, what you have is uh, sometimes in some harsh environments, you have plants that orient their leaves to maximize photosynthesis, okay? So they do solar tracking. Uh, and this uh, process is done with a network of distributed leaves, right, that you can replace instead of a large, expensive uh, leaf. Uh, and plants are finally compliant systems, meaning that they move by deforming their tissues. They are uh, advanced uh, structures. Uh, and so what we propose uh, is a system made out of uh, these three principles that um, is composed of several uh, modules that will be in front of a, of a window, and uh, each module uh, orients itself with the elevation of the sun, but also its east to west movement. Uh, and the system is adapted uh, to each uh, geographic uh, location and also facade orientation. Uh, and each module is a thin curved uh, surface that is continuously deformed throughout the day uh, in a specific position, um, and this position comes from uh, operating the system by solving uh, optimization system throughout the day with the objective of having uh, minimized, uh, by having a minimized uh, energy demand in your building, but uh, keeping a constant constraint of uh, daylight levels. So right now we have a proof of concept uh, prototype, uh, but over the next uh, 12 months we're hoping to uh, bring, bring it to the stage of an advanced prototype uh, and potentially a, a market uh, product. Um, and so the idea uh, is that we're going to be funded by the IP, IP uh, fund of the Dean of Research that we 
uh, were awarded in January, and with that we're trying to solve like two main challenges, which is to uh, bring aesthetically pleasing uh, products uh, for architects and homeowners, uh, and also uh, make a financially viable product. Uh, you know, uh, windows covering is a growing but competitive business, um, and so we're hoping that by providing a value, by making uh, your uh, space more comfortable, uh, will differentiate ourselves from our competitors. And so with the funds uh, of the uh, Innovation Forum, we'll run uh, some perception analysis uh, on, on, on people to evaluate and quantify uh, the perception of our uh, system on people. Thank you. Victor, really nice job. Thank you. I really like the, the simulation. Thank you. Um, Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, different populations have different uh, kind of demands for that. Uh, like architects, they have a, in general like a very set idea of what the building should look like, and so if you have a product that tends to kind of deviate from that, they might not be able to kind of like uh, you know reach for this product as like standard. Uh, but if you already make this product kind of like a, something that's already out there, available, but then you might be able to create some awareness in arch architects, and I think that would come from like homeowners that might be more susceptible to kind of innovating if they see like a direct uh, interest. Victor, when you said financially viable product, that there's a lot of competitors, are you, are you saying that you're struggling to make it at a cost that is scalable, or can you talk more about that part? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so what we use, like the, the method we use is uh, vacuum forming, uh, and so we use the, this material called PETG, which is like, close to what uh, Coke bottles are made of, uh, and we also use actuation that's like super cheap, so like the idea is that each module would be like very inexpensive. Like we haven't done the full design of the system, uh, but like, uh, for instance, IKEA released uh, Recently, like there are smart shades, and basically it's like interior shades that go up and down with Alexa, uh, and so those are priced around like 100, 100 to 130 uh, and they are like way cheaper than competitors that are around like three to 500 dollars. But they are interior, so they don't do anything for saving energy uh, in buildings. So are there any tax, kind of, uh, Are there any tax credits that are that are like applicable to this type of product that you could use as a way to kind of drive sales? Yeah, uh, I think these would be, uh, we need to kind of uh, explore a bit more, uh, but uh, you need to be certified to to have those credits, I assume. So um, I'm not exactly sure how would we need to, go, to do that, because I know that like certification in the building industry is, is a very uh, difficult process. Uh, I mean, I know from, it, from hearing from other people. Uh, in, in like, if you want to do like a commercial, uh, you know, office buildings. For home, it's, it might be different. Yeah. So it's still a little fuzzy on how it actually works. Mm -hmm. is it in your abstract, you wrote a little bit about it being mobile. You can go to the garage, you store it, and pull it out. I oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, sitting on your window. Yeah. Right? So I'm just I'm okay. fuzzy on how mm -hmm. it actually mm -hmm. works. Yeah, yeah, so, so uh, right now, uh, so you see the frame here, it's like the, the frame of a window. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, basically the idea is that you know, shades, they, they go up and down to kind of liberate like, the whole view. But when you talk about uh, external shading, it tends to kind of sometimes stay in front of the window all the time. And so it be, it's like always in the view, right? And so, so how would that work for like an industrial setting where you've got a skyscraper? Right, right. Uh, so I think it, 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 you need to have like either very like a strong systems that is fixed or uh, something that is more mobile but that can be stored uh, above the window. And so, so that's something in the next phase that we're going to kind of decide. Because right now, right now the system, as we, as we have simulated it, uh, it, it's, it stays in front of the, of the window. Uh, and I think like, it it's maybe makes more sense to have it go up and completely liberate the view. Exterior of the house. How does it respond to other conditions, like sort of wind and you know, sort of how rigid is it? And and what's the visibility from the interior of the house? Is it sort of through the slats? Is it mm -hmm. you know? If you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Um, so 
you know, the, the visibility uh, on the exterior. So, okay, so like shading systems when they are outside, like the wind plays a huge role. Uh, and in general, if you want to resist the wind, you have to have like a very strong uh, system if they are like fixed. And so that's kind of part of the, the same question, saying like, should it go up all the way down, be stored, and when it's windy, you just like uh, fold it. Uh, so that's something we need to work on. But from the inside, uh, the idea is that, uh, you know, in any case, if it's really sunny, the sun comes through your uh, window, you would not stare at the window directly. So uh, if there are shades, like the idea is that they would provide some kind of diffuse uh, light. Uh, and so hopefully, um, you know, make the uh, interior space, uh, you know, comfortable. And, and that's kind of like, I think, uh, an opportunity uh, to kind of simulate that uh, in parts of like uh, maybe like business strategy. To, we could use like for instance people's cell phone to like scan the room and then say if you have like this system, uh, what is your room going to look like? Uh, for instance, yeah. So, so Victor, the question I have is, let's just say that I spend five thousand dollars a year heating my house. How much? Of that, and I'm in the northeast. How much of that is likely to be energy waste because of leaks that come through windows? Mm -hmm. And how much with the installation of your system do you think I would save? So if half of my heating bill is because of leaks of that $2,500, how much do you think you could help address? Oh, you know, like, uh, if you have leaks in your house, that's the first thing you should uh, fix. Uh, no, no, I know, I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, this, this will not solve the leakage through the windows. Like, it, it's, it, in, the, in your case, where, like, heating is controlled by, like, the, let's say, the, the, the build quality, uh, what this system will provide is, is a, a more, uh, you know, comfortable living space. Uh, so that, that's like the, the value that you're gonna get. Like it's not gonna save you, uh, or it's, gonna, it's not going to influence the heating. Uh, because heating again, uh, you know, this system pro uh, prevents overheating in summer. Uh, in winter, it controls the, the quality of daylight inside of your space. It doesn't like increase the heating of, through the windows. So you don't consider this an energy savings play? No, no, it is, it is, but in, in like only in uh, only in, uh, in in summer where you you have a lot of sun and you want to cool down your building. Like in, in winter, uh, this system controls the uh, daylight quality. It does that also in summer, but in summer it also prevents overheating. So the energy aspect is more for the summer uh, part. So summer months in Phoenix, particularly. Yeah, but like for instance, what I was saying in Juno, in if you have very low. Uh, you know, sun, you still have a lot of sun coming directly through your windows and you need to control the daylight quantity. So, uh, actually Juno is like the same height as Stockholm, which uh, has a lot of shading on their buildings. So, Victor, this is, uh, it seems to me that what you sort of invented here is this sort of shape shift. Right, right. And what you have is an application that has some inherent difficulties in it in terms of ROI, cost, mm -hmm. aesthetics, etc. Can this be applied to something else? For example, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, but so, so it, yeah, 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 yeah. I think the the question is like uh, how much weight you can carry with the system. Uh, like a, a solar panel is kind of heavy, uh, and like the the tilting mechanism to do solar tracking, it's it has to carry the weight of the solar panel. So that might not be the best application, especially because you already have systems like that. But for instance, you can think of you know orienting parabolas. Uh, you can have like, so this, this system like orients it, you know, creates a movement like this, but also kind of like this. So you can combine them uh, to have like a very soft uh, and lightweight uh, mechanism to orient uh, parabolas or, I mean, you're thinking of solar tracking, but you know, uh, there are other similar applications. And also like, you know, this system you can, knowing the, the know-how the know here, you can like make, uh, for instance, grippers for robots uh, made out of like a single surface. Uh, Things like that. So, so that's that's also part of like the provisional pattern that we have with the uh, uh, with the uh, that was part of the IP uh, from kind of describing the other applications there. Thank you, Victor. Thank you.
The next company presenting, uh, General Gondolas, and we're gonna hear from Stephen Lee on custom gondolas for balloon-borne astronomy and other scientific programs. Is this on? Okay, good. <laughs> All right, hi everyone, I'm Stephen. Um, I am a PhD student in two departments, of physics and mechanical and aerospace engineering. I work on balloon-borne telescope projects uh, led by Professor uh, William Jones. Um, and I'm here to present to you an idea to commercialize balloon-borne telescope gondolas. So what is a balloon-borne telescope? As the name suggests, a balloon-borne telescope is a telescope carried by a helium balloon to the upper stratosphere. Um, this allows the uh, telescope to point above 99.9% .9 of the atmosphere. And, and because of this, the uh, balloon-borne telescopes are at a important sweet spot between ground-based telescopes and space-based telescopes. Ground-based telescopes are, are, can be significantly limited by the atmosphere, and space-based telescopes can be uh, prohibitively expensive for smaller observational projects, which is why balloon-borne telescopes are a, a great alternative to many astronomical applications. The gondola uh, is the structure that holds the scientific instrument and is connected to the balloon. And it contains many highly specialized subsystems. Currently in the uh, industry, um, every, every, every uh, organization designs and builds their gondola from scratch. This is a highly risky process, and it leads to a lot of failures. And, um, and this can also incur a significant amount of cost uh, uh, in resources and time that could otherwise be used in a better, developing a better instrument. So um, we propose that we're pro providing the first uh, commercial company that, that, that will provide gondolas and launch services to our customers. We, we will sell uh, gondolas, modular gondolas um, at a fraction of the current uh, cost and time. Uh, using existing technologies um, and subsystems that we have developed throughout the years. Uh, each gondola will be tailored to the un uh, needs unique to each individual customer's experiment. In the first three years, we'll be selling our gondolas at uh, 500000 to a $1 million each, and um, eventually we'll be able to reduce that cost to $200,000. And in the long run, once we have a standardized system, we can further reduce that cost down to $50,000, which will greatly increase our market size. Um, uh, it, as the launch technologies get cheaper, uh, we can also expand our design portfolio to include non-academic applications as well as space platforms. Highly cost-effective balloon and space platforms will be a multi-billion dollar industry in the coming years. General Gondola has inherited the Experience R&D team from Princeton and the University of Toronto, as well as the knowledge base of the past two decades of successful balloon experiments. Um, our, our team is capable of vastly expanding the uh, reach of balloon-borne platforms. This is a low-risk startup um, uh, with an existing customer base. Please support us for a cheaper, more efficient, and more um, effective solution. Thank you. Uh, really exciting. Um, so, so it's sort of a two-fold question. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one is when you look at, say, Blue Origin or SpaceX, right. one of the things that they are sort of proposing is bringing the cost really down. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. So my first question is, how does that play into sort of your observation? And my second question is, what, you mentioned that you vastly increase your market size when you go from 500 mm -hmm. to 30,000 dollars. What are the market logistics that you can attack at that little price point that you can't at 500? Okay, so I'll, I'll answer um, both of those questions. Uh, the, the first one is, um, there are all these companies out there that were, are, are drastically reducing space, uh, space launches, and th that's actually great news for us. Currently, uh, the reason we don't want to directly attacking space industry is because uh, launch costs, costs are, are very high. They're on the order of tens of millions of dollars, uh, sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars. And uh, experiments uh, say we don't actually care about um, uh, 
like saving money on gondolas because the launch cost is gonna already gonna be so so high. Like so so we're gonna be we're gonna be um, uh, b building uh, it uh, since we're government institutions. So we're gonna go grab as much money as possible. But but in the future, in the next two decades, launch costs can can uh, drop down to fifteen million dollars, and then there's suddenly an incentive for for uh, for. Uh, people to to look at cheaper space systems, and th this is uh, uh, the uh, what we want to attack um, in the future to, to use our gondola technologies and and go into that space industry. Uh, and now now for your uh, second question is how can we how can we uh, uh, how can reducing the cost will increase the market? Currently, um, in in this area, um, in the first few years. This is what we are attacking right now. This is a very safe thing. NASA provides around $15 million per year for astronomy projects, and, and then um, these, these projects will need gondolas. And what we, uh, what we are proposing right now is to just sell them to, 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 to NASA. And, and these projects, um, NASA supports around uh, two to three projects every year. And, and these are giant projects. These, these are the kind of projects that will change the, the future of science. And, and of course, uh, there's only very few of these projects. W once we reduce the cost, there could be smaller projects that, that, that s some high school students can, can, can write a proposal. I want to measure the atmospheric em emission of these serious clouds in this altitude. Or it could be um, some, some, uh, some group is saying, oh, we, we want to uh, detect neutrinos from under the ground using balloons. And, and these are, are, are all ideas that do not uh, warrant multi-million dollar budgets. Uh, and, and, then, and then we will be able to provide them with solutions. Thank you. Um, just curious, what is the lifespan or longevity of the gondola? So okay. how often would customers need to get this replaced and maintenance? Right, so um, currently the, the balloon, once it's launched, uh, it can last anywhere between like one night to uh, many tens of nights. Um, that the, it will just be floating in the upper stratosphere. And when it comes down, like who knows what's gonna happen. Like it can either get destroyed, it can fall in the ocean, and it's not recoverable. And, uh, and then like, if it is re recoverable, actually, we, we could actually just refurbish it and re reuse it. Um, but because uh, what we're opposed Proposing is so much cheaper. It's an order of magnitude cheaper than uh, what what an institution has to put into this currently. If they're doing it themselves, um, uh, they, they're mostly incentivized to directly just purchase from uh, uh, like ha have a re renewal, like almost like a subscription. And sometimes for for many. Uh, certain experiments, they, they want to re reuse the gondola over and over again. So it will just be the same product. Um, there will be uh, $300,000 each, and they'll, they'll just uh, keep, keep using the same thing. And then they will be build a new one every time. And of course, it's great for us because it will be cheaper every time. Uh, yes, uh, actually, that's an interesting uh, question. Uh, I've been into it, like currently, we do not, uh, to clarify, we do not provide the launch services. Right now, the launch services are entirely done by NASA. And what, what NASA does is that they, they integrate the, the trajectory of a potential flight path, and then, and then they would uh, terminate uh, the, the telescope by uh, detaching it from the balloon, and the parachute would deploy when it's approximately not about above a human population, basically. So they will uh, terminate it when it's safe. Christina, just for my benefit, take us through how many launches take place per year right now. Okay, so in, in the United States, uh, uh, the gondola launches are run by the Columbia Scientific Ballooning Facility, and uh, there, uh, there are two seasons, one in the summer, one in the fall, and approximately uh, each season will be, uh, uh, have three to four gondola launches. And then that's just in, in the continental United States. They also run a base in Wanaka, New Zealand, which also have three or four launches. They also run a base in a McMurdo Station in Antarctica, which this, where, where this picture was taken, they also have three or four launches. 
So that's just operated by the United States under the $15 million budget. There, there is a competing, um, uh, competing group uh, at uh, the French space agency, CNES, which are providing, uh, providing also a bunch of launches. They do some in Canada, they do some in, in, in uh, 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 Karuna, Sweden, and, and uh, just yeah, so if yes. It would be around 100, yes. 100 lunches, yes. Okay. And, and your thesis is it's only 100 because it costs, or that NASA will only spend $7.5 million for this kind of equipment mm -hmm. and, and only has the resources to do two or three projects in a given season. Right. So by reducing, and you haven't really, I, I haven't heard exactly what you're going to do to effectively you know, reduce the cost by 90%. Right. In doing so, there are going to be a lot more launches. Right. So, so this the project, um, the the launch cost for this is around uh, two million dollars. Every time you launch this thing, it's around two million dollars. So, so uh, current um, uh, current people uh, who are building gondolas, uh, the, the organization that are building gondolas, they're like, um, okay, so if the launch is so expensive, why do we want to save money for for um, for, for the gondola? And in the future, uh, there will be launch providers. Cur currently, there is a company in Arizona that's providing launches for $300,000. And it suddenly, it makes much more sense to save money on gondolas, because if the gondola is also $300,000 and the launch is $300,000, and it's, uh, it's like that's a comparable thing. So for, and, and this trend will only continue. More and more space technologies will allow uh, to have us to have smaller and smaller balloons, which will support maybe a $50,000 launch, and that's the target that we're aiming for. So the gondola that we're looking at there, what aspects of that are specifically tailored to that project? Because it's not the equipment. Um, so uh, the mechanical structure is, is the most thing that will be different between experiments, because this, this whole structure in the middle, that's the telescope. The gondola has to somehow fit around the telescope and able to support it, point it, and, uh, and uh, actually be able to uh, like operate it. Um, th things like commanding and telemetry system, that's a standardized thing. Uh, pointing and scanning and stabilization system, that involves cameras, computers, and an algorithm, and which is also a standardized thing. Power and thermal distribution sy systems it is uh, how we control the power and, and, and the, uh, the, the batteries and the solar panels. And these things are, are standardized. So, so we have these three blocks that are already, it's already set. It's optimized over two decades of successful launches. And this is the only thing that needs to be developed per experiment. Thank you, Stephen. The, um, I can't remember if you talked about it here in your presentation or if it was in some of the background material, but I remember you, uh, I remember some, uh, something about a two-year runway to building these gondolas. Is yep. that something that you're able to, to reduce the, the development time for these as part of this effort, or? Um, yeah, so currently it's, uh, it, it's anywhere between five to 10 years by, by large groups because they, were keep, uh, they keep wanting to try new things and, uh, and, and then they will have a lot of failures that will drag on the, the time. So we want to reduce it to only two years. So that is pretty much the only construction cost, the construction time that's needed. Yeah. Thank you very much, Stephen. I appreciate the energy. Uh, up next, we're gonna hear f about ultra-efficient EPUs for future data centers. And we're going to hear from Minji Chen. Oh, there's, there's, there's two. Okay. Right. Good afternoon. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Yusuf Alasser, and I'm here with my teammate Yanan Chen, and we're going to talk to you about our idea for a new architecture for data center power delivery. Uh, so, currently, the United States data center industry consumes 90 billion kilowatt hours of electricity a year. Now, the amount of carbon dioxide emissions that this amount of electricity generates is equivalent to the amount of carbon dioxide emitted by the entire American airline industry. Now, on a global scale, data centers consume 416 billion kilowatt hours of electricity a year. And these numbers are only expected to continue to grow in the near future. Uh, so, in order to look at how we can 
go about making this process more efficient, it's useful to look at how power is actually delivered to a typical data center. So power begins at the grid where it's generated and then transmitted to the data center. Now once it reaches the data center, it must power the uninterruptible power supply, then make its way to the rack, and finally the motherboard. Each of these processes incurs losses, and currently the grid to CPU efficiency is around 63%. We've developed a series of technologies to A, reduce the number of power conversion stages, and B, improve the efficiency of each stage. Our first technology, the Energy Processing Unit, or EPU for short, can achieve an efficiency of 98% for power delivery to the rack. And our second innovation, the power brick can achieve a 95% efficiency for power delivery to the motherboard. Our goal is to cut the losses by three times and get a grid to CPU efficiency of around 88%. So in order to do this, we've developed new architecture, new packaging, new control, and utilize state-of-the-art wideband gap semiconductor devices. Our new architecture only processes the differential power between multiple servers instead of their full power rating and this greatly reduces the power conversion stress. Our new packaging minimizes the impedance seen between the CPU and the motherboard, which allows us to deliver power to the point of load at extremely high efficiencies. Good afternoon. I'm Yenan, the CEO. Uh, today, the global data center power supply market is 10 billion US dollars and we are targeting a 10% market share within five years. Our product can reduce the annual data center cost by 12%, which translates to $170 million savings for companies like Google every year. We will finish field testing by the end of this year, and then partner with server manufacturers and OEMs to make our products available before 2021. Our technology is applicable to all large-scale modular energy systems, such as solar farms and battery, energy, energy storage, battery storage systems, which are enabling technology for the future smart grid. Our team consists of one professor, one postdoc, and two graduate students. All of us are very excited about this technology. Data centers are critical infrastructure for the future world. It is of great economical and societal benefit to make data center more efficient and more sustainable. We believe that we have found a solution, and we look forward to bring this solution to the real world. Thank you. Thank you, Yanan and Yosef. Because we now we have only built a prototype, but we let's uh, assume for a second it works. Okay, everything is working. And let's, everything. Right. Let's, let's make sure. Let's just assume that it works. Why would they not do it? Talk at the same time. Oh, uh, I think once we finish the product level product uh, prototype, we can we have confidence that we can they can use our product. Yeah, so one of the challenges I think that uh, is going to be uh, it, when we have this final product working is that these data centers uh, and their servers uh, have a set of standards that they kind of run on. Um, so we would really need to work on our technology becoming one of these standards, one of these future standards for data centers to actually really have confidence to adopt our product. So until we get to that point, I think that still remains our major challenge. Um, but I think once we can do that and work with OEMs and work with uh, open source projects to actually do that, I think we have the confidence that we can do exactly as you said. Go to Google, say, yeah. here's how we're gonna save you money. Uh, you just have to install our product, and I think we're gonna be pretty confident. Like? What would it take to retrofit the Google? Yeah, um, so actually, data centers actually work on a pretty quick timeline. Around every five years, they replace the servers for the data centers. So essentially, I think we have a pretty easy, uh, there's, a, there's a low barrier to entry, I think, in that sense of that they're already constantly replacing their servers. So essentially it's just whenever they want to replace their servers, they would just buy our EPU server essentially instead of how they would traditionally replace their servers. Can you retrofit existing setups also? Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. We can't just replace uh, uh, power supply for the server. Okay. 
And you don't have to wait for the next cycle. You don't have to, no. Right. And, oh, and another good news is Google already uh, start to update their data center's power supply architecture. So in next month, there will be an open computing conference in Bay Area. We will pa participate in this conference to promote our technology to be the next standard, next generation standard. You said, is there still anything you're no, not clear on? I'm just trying to figure out why this is not the greatest thing since sliced bread. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's what we're hoping it is. <laughs> because, uh, so, so, guys, tell us a little bit more about how you went through the calculations. How, without oh. any, I don't know how, if you're a prototype stage or whether or not you actually have done a lot of testing of okay. that prototype to be able to kind of say, with a great degree of confidence, here's the, the savings, the energy savings of each step of the, of the so, so you mean those efficiency numbers that we listed, basically, essentially? Yeah, so uh, for the EPU, we actually did build a prototype. Um, and we tested it with how many? It was uh, 60 hard drives, essentially. Right, right, right. We have a prototype. The EPU can provide power for 60, 60 hard disk drives at uh, efficiency. The highest efficiency is 99.7%. So the 98% kind of reflects how right. uh, we would see when we actually integrate the UPS and rack. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're targeting an efficiency of 98%, and we've actually demonstrated that we can achieve higher efficiencies than this. Um, so that's kind of how we got these numbers that we so, used here. Yeah, so, so the way to think about it is if I, if I look at your solution and I take 95 and I multiply by Yeah, 98, exactly. Times yeah. 95, that's how you get 88. Okay. Yeah. But I want to stop right there. And then I compare that against the traditional method where it's grid to UPS to rack. Yeah. Because that's the apples to apples comparison. So what's the, the difference in numbers between the efficiency that, that I get 95 times 98 versus 95 times 95 times 87? I'm just trying to, orders of magnitude, I'm just trying to figure out until we get to the power brick, at, at least at the EPU level, there's very significant savings available based on your own prototype. Yes. And that's, that's observable data that you can show a would-be data center customer. Yeah, exactly. We have yeah. that data. Yep. Okay. Are these two different sales? Um, so if you have to integrate this power unit with the EPU versus you have to integrate, integrate it with these, the, the power brick and the, and the motor, it, are those two different products, two different right, sales right. processes? Right. Yeah, so they are two different products, yes. But we're marketing it as... Uh, a combined architecture, so a future architecture for data center power delivery. So we're trying to target the whole power supply market, essentially, for it. And who do you sell to? Do you sell to the data center? Do you sell to so the actually go to the first slide. manufacturers? Do you yeah, is it an OEM product? Uh, our customer will be the server manufacturers okay. and the motherboard manufacturers. Hey guys, I'm curious about your development costs. So what does it take you from a cost perspective to get from where you are today to that full demo? Wise. In terms of the second generation of the prototype. Oh yeah, we now we have finished the first generation prototype of EPU. Then we will uh, develop our second second version, which will be much more like a product. And we will develop the first version of Power Brick. How much did that? How much did the development to that? How much does development to the prototype cost you? And how much do you think that you'll be able to reduce that when you're producing at scale? So how much did the first version cost, essentially, what she's asking? Oh my gosh, I'm thinking about this reduce. Uh, is it reduce? Yeah. I think we can reduce the cost by at least 50%. How much did it cost you? How much did it cost <laughs> to the first version, essentially? It, it, yeah, because... Just uh, ballpark, we, I'm just curious. The components, basically yeah, the components and the hardware cost and everything. In, in, in labs is different, yeah, quite different. That's, so maybe the first version we cost, we, we uh, the cost is 2000 or 3000 US dollars. Okay. But the, then there's pretty big differences between a prototype that we right. build in the lab and something that we're trying to actually build for the company. So. At scale? Yeah, I mean, at scale, I think we can reduce the cost, definitely. Um, I, I don't think the cost of manufacturing is going to be a big cost uh, in terms of. That's, 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 that's yeah. Like yeah. No, I don't that. believe so. I, I believe it actually improves with scale. Visioning an X 
strategy on this venture? It's an exit strategy. Um, so I think that this technology is something that would entice these server manufacturers a lot, and not only server manufacturers, but data center owners. Um, so in terms of an exit strategy, I think, uh, are you asking about like acquisition or something like that? Like about a company acquisition? Because I think that's definitely within the, that's definitely within the realm of possibility, I would think, um, in terms of an exit strategy. How good is the idea? Uh, so we have two, two patents yeah. issued, uh, and one is pending for the, we have the numbers, I think. It should yeah. be there. Which one is pending? Uh, the one for the EPU the prototype. <laughs> Thank you, Yusef and Yanan. Uh, next will be Greg Davies presenting Advanced Quantitative Medical Imaging. Hi, I'm Greg Davies. Today I'm going to present an advanced quantitative imaging technology for applications that our team is developing in the geosciences department at Princeton University. So I'm going to start with an example here. So every year there are 30 million mammograms in the US. For every 10,000 mammograms that women receive, 1,000 are called back for further testing. Of those 1,000 who are called back for further testing, only 20 of those turn out to have cancer. Furthermore, of those original 10,000 women we looked at, on, uh, five cancers will be missed or go undiagnosed. So what if we caught those missed cancers? Or what if we managed to remove 50 mammograms and five invasive biopsies for every cancer patient that we find? This, uh, you know, this system basically creates a huge amount of unnecessary procedures, which both cost money, but also has negative patient outcomes. Um, uh, you know, particularly anxiety, um, you know, medical procedures that aren't necessary for women. This is just one of the examples of where our quantitative imaging technology can provide a lot of value. So this uh, technology is uh, based on geoscientific principles that have been developed for the last 30 years or so. And so the tools have traditionally been used in imaging of subsurface reservoirs for oil and gas exploration, um, but they've also been used in global seismology. Um, we're bringing them from the kilometer scale down to the millimeter scale for medical applications. Um, but several factors have come together that makes this the perfect time to apply these technologies. So we've had maturing of high-performance computing in addition to um, uh, uh, you know, highly refined algorithms and software that allow us now to generate these sort of images within a few minutes, something that would have taken several months, even a few months, uh, sorry, only a few years ago. So that's a huge uh, improvement. So the result is uh, an MRI quality um, three-dimensional image using ultrasound. Um, but more importantly, it allows us to ex extract information such as tissue stiffness, density, and attenuation that existing uh, technologies cannot provide. Um, I do apologize, this appears to be an old slide deck. Um, so the value that this uh, 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 combination of attributes could bring is enormous. So the images allow us to uh, positively assess whether body tissues are healthy or diseased, enabling diagnoses that were not previously possible together with eliminating uh, discomfort from traditional mammograms, um, we can greatly increase patient comfort, satisfaction, and retention, um, which is the number one priority for clinics. Um, in addition, we can reduce patient callbacks, which actually increases insurer uh, reimbursements, um, allowing the clinics to capture more revenue. And it's also a, a rapid and a radiation-free approach, so that has particular interest for pediatric applications, for example. Um, so in the US, if we look at CT, MR, um, and X-ray, that's approximately $11 billion market annually. Um, we believe that we can viably service 30% of that market with our technology. And then if we're looking at a, you know, a you know, starting strategy, if we target the mammogram um, uh, area, just in the tri-state, we believe that we have a potential to target $15 million of sale, sales in that sort of first year period, and then moving on. Uh, you know, to further products from that point forward. Um, so at the moment, we're working hard to de-risk key uncertainties. So 
um, really characterizing the ultrasonic hardware, and this is something that's specific to us and that we need to uh, properly do in order to use our technique. Um, and then we're going to focus our funds and time towards developing a simple alpha prototype device. And so that it, we'll be able to image small objects, and then we'll be able to demonstrate the viability of our product to investors um, and to you know, uh, doctors, radiologists, and so forth. Um, and in, in parallel, we're going to work um, to develop relationships with key partners, which is essential, obviously, for the medical field, uh, build, out, build out our business model, um, and then look at developing strategy for device development, um, approval, FDA, for example, um, and then market entry. Thanks. Thank you very much. So, Greg, tell us about what does this look like? What do you think that the prototype will yield? Is it going to be something that fits in the size of the palm? Is it going to be a large MRI machine? And how do you think about um, uh, bringing this, this, this uh, product to market? Yep, yep. So, um, to a large extent, it could be tailored to specific applications. So, for example, um, it may be, so in the mammogram sort of space, um, it would sort of be integrated into some tool that allows women to, you know, quickly and easily um, interface with the device. So it might be integrated into some sort of seat type arrangement that you sit down in, uh, and you can take a quick scan. And then, you know, a relatively small piece of apparatus, certainly compared to a traditional CT scanner or an MRI, for example, but perhaps slightly larger than the ultrasound device that you might see in a, you know, obgyn clinic or something along those lines. Um, you know, for uh, you know, if we're looking at musculoskeletal applications, which we believe we can also target quite effectively. Again, it might be just a small device that could be wheeled between different clinics, that could be wheeled to different uh, rooms in the, uh, in the clinic and that sort of thing. So certainly it would be um, significantly smaller and more portable than, you know, the sort of traditional CT, MRI type approach. And that's, you know, one of its key advantages. But, you know, probably not initially. I think that's something which becomes a value proposition a little bit down the track as we start to enter more markets for the product. Man, it may be way too early to speculate, but is this a $100,000 tool? Is this a $50,000 tool? Am I going in the right direction? Um, yeah, yeah, you're, you're definitely in the right ballpark. So, I mean, if we're looking at the early, so the alpha prototype is gonna be significantly more expensive. So, you know, we'd be talking at about a couple of hundred thousand dollars, a few hundred thousand dollars for development, but that's using sort of very conventional tools that we buy off the shelf from you know, manufacturers who can customize and provide those items. When we look to move to a, uh, you know, a commercial product, that becomes very much more like the foundry approach. So now we're spending a large amount of money up front. We're designing um, an integrated circuit for the, which actually integrates with the uh, transducer technology. But now you can pump that out, you know, $10,000, maybe less $2,000 a piece and integrate that into a system. So you know, scale is a really important factor in this um, if we want to bring that cost down. But, you know, certainly coming in significantly lower than, you know, um, three, you know, CT or MRI would be, for example. And we believe always would be lower than what MRI would be. Yeah. Just to follow that technically, is this something where the crunching would be done locally or does this need to, to sort of be done separately? Um, I mean, so we could approach this two different ways. So computing power has improved to the extent that, you know, for simpler um, reconstructions, you could potentially supply sort of a computational unit locally. The way that we, you know, would like to think about the business model is that we actually provide that remotely. And so that provides benefits um, that we can sort of optimize workflows. So, you know, do customers need the image now or can they wait for a few days? Um, we can offer a better reconstruction next year we can tell you more information, you know, we can sort of continually provide more value for you as we sort of develop our algorithms and those sort of things. And I think that motivates us doing more of a pay per scan type approach. So, you know, they either purchase the equipment for cost from us and then we sell it to them on a per scan basis. Maybe they actually get the equipment for free and agree to use it for a certain number of, you know, clicks per year or whatever. Um, and then, uh, you know, depending on this, you know, what they want, is it urgent, can they wait, you know, we, you know the price point ends up differently for the, for the customer. Hey Greg, the um, imaging technology space is really crowded and there's some really big players in the space and so I find that when you have like a high barrier to entry like that, like you have to have something like really game changing that you can communicate and so if you had to pick one game changing 
um, differentiator of this product, what would it be if you could only pick one? Um, it provides information about tissues, you know, so in the mammography sense, you know, you can identify which, you know, a tumor tissue is, which you just cannot do with current technologies. Just that, you know, diagnostic capability, essentially. I mean, it, it's, it's, you know, it's a bad way to present a value proposition to say diagnostic capability, because it doesn't necessarily mean much, but being able to identify what a tissue is is critical in being able to reduce those number of callback procedures, and we can do that very well. What, I was a little fuzzy on what you have validated on synthetic data and what you have validated on real data. Can you clarify? Yep, yep. So at, at this time, we spent a lot of effort in generating, so in, maybe instead of using synthetic, I'll say computer models. So we'll generate a computer model of a liver, um, and then we generate sort of experiment, we generate experimental data from that computer model, and then we put that experimental data into our model, uh, into our algorithm, and then so generate that picture. A real we have not scanned a real liver, that's correct. Um, and so some of the experiments that we're starting to run now are taking, you know, at the, you know, basic steps like, you know, transmitting waves through media, measuring that, making sure that we can accurately model that in our software. Um, and that's, you know, that's 95% of the battle right there is, is okay, doing so that. Yeah. What, what's the sort of risk in the translation step between the actual scan of the liver and, in other words, how, how closely do you think that will correlate with your computational model of the liver once you get the data set? Um, uh, is there risk there that your computational model will not work with the actual scan of the liver? Yeah, so, I mean, we're not... The nice thing about the process is we don't assume anything about what the liver actually looks like. The algorithm doesn't sort of you know, have any you know, underlying assumptions as to what that looks like. So um, it's all really just collecting accurate data and being able to put that into the algorithm is more the question than can it reconstruct a liver, for example. So some of those early, so the early stages that we're working on at the moment are, you know, let's deal with signal to noise issues, let's deal with, you know, very accurately understanding what the hardware you know, sends out in terms of wave fields and these sort of questions. So, um, if those things turn out, uh, you know, well, then, you know, our concern is not whether we can image a liver because that will be that will follow naturally at that point. Yeah. So the mentorship Victor is now proceeding on this um, on this venture. Um, what's that going to be for you in terms of getting into the next step? Yeah, so we're currently involved in the NSF National Science Foundation Innovation Core program, and so a few of us just came in early this morning, 11 o'clock, so we've just been away on the road for 10 days or so. Um, and that's been you know, excellent for us because we've talked with over 90 people now across, you know, radiologists, doctors, oncologists, people in medical insurance, um, technologists, you know, sort of, you know, eight out of ten areas that we'd like to speak with at this stage. And that's really focused us on, you know, what is what is important for a clinic, what is important for a doctor in a, you know, research hospital and these sort of things. So um, we'll have more time to kind of incorporate those learnings as we finish off the program in a couple of weeks' time. Um, but we're, you know, really using that information to, I guess, do a few things. So one is, what are we aiming our first product at? So what are we actually... You know, where can we most effectively you know, spend our time and money in developing a product? What things do we need to do in advance to really free up that pathway? So that's you know, <coughs> speaking early with FDA, speaking early with clinical partners, um, and, and really continuing to build out these kind of key relationships in those areas. Um, because our understanding is that we can really ease our barriers if we sort of you know, think about those areas much in advance. Um, yeah, so we believe that we have, would most likely have a predicate product at this point in time, so we can say that we're not, we're not sort of altering the tissues or doing anything different than an existing piece of hardware does, even though we use the data very differently. You know, how we're interacting with the human body is no different from what we currently do. And so that lowers the bar quite significantly. You're probably still talking, you know, three to four years for that process to happen, you know, moving through all of the 
maybe you know, preclinical 30 to 40 patients on our alpha prototype device. Then you start developing the next you know, real device. Then it's you know, much larger scale in the research hospitals. You're looking at hundreds of procedures per year. You know, proving that you're as good as existing technology. And then it's just time and data to say, we can actually do much better than the existing technology does. And at that point, you know, you really start to push adoption in the early, you know, early adopters and those sort of things. So, um, it's a it's a time-consuming process. Yeah. It's, it's okay. Thank you very much, Craig. <laughs> and last but not least, it's a Craig Arnold. I don't know if he's here. The power of beard is not here, but we are going to hear from Miles Cole about vertical vertical injection technology apparatus. Vita. All right, hello everyone. I'm Miles Cole and I'm a sophomore here at Princeton University and I've been working with mechanical and aerospace engineering professor Craig Arnold to create Invictus Technologies. So at birth, I was diagnosed with severe hemophilia A, which is a bleeding disorder requiring me to intravenously inject myself every single day in order to receive my medication. Um, despite my advanced practice of literally injecting myself every single day, it is still so hard to accurately hit a vein on the first attempt. Most times I'll have to stick myself three or four different times before actually getting the vein. Now the national average for trained nurses successfully hitting a vein on the first attempt is only 75%. And not only are these injections painful, um, they're also expensive, costing the United States over $3 billion a year due to the infections and injuries that all these additional needle sticks cause. Now, the craziest part is that despite living in such a technologically advanced world, the needle injection technology itself has not actually evolved in the past 100 years until now. So our solution to uh, all of these issues is our portable automatic intravenous injection device, Vita, where by using our proprietary breakthrough vertical injection technology, we're actually able to create a small portable device that a user wraps around their arm to have automatically inject a needle into their vein with extreme accuracy. Similar to how the EpiPen changed the landscape for epinephrine delivery, we're hoping that our device will be adopted as the new standard method for easily and safely delivering intravenous injections. So how it works is the first part is our Vita uses novel infrared optical sensing to create a map of all the veins in your arm and then employs innovative tactile sensing technology to actually vertically inject the needle down perpendicular to your veins through your skin, stopping at the precise moment that it pierces your vein and holding it there throughout the duration of the injection. Now, the other technologies attempting to do automatic intravenous injections are all big, bulky, stationary devices that are honestly just these big, scary robotic claws that try to infuse you laterally. Um, the main limitation with all of these devices is that they use robotics in an attempt to mimic how a human would infuse a vein instead of taking full advantage of what new advanced technology actually has to offer. On the other hand, due to our vertical injection technology, we're able to build a device that is small, portable, cost efficient, easy to use on oneself, and much more accurate and reliable than manually infusing. There are a number of potential markets that our device could potentially impact. Um, it's one could easily imagine our device having a profound impact in hospitals, chemotherapy infusion centers, disaster relief settings, ambulances, or for military medics on the battlefield, to name a few. Now, besides myself, our core team here at Invictus Technologies consists of prolific inventor Craig Arnold, who was actually the keynote speaker last year here at the Innovation Forum, as well as a knowledgeable team um, of advisors who bring entrepreneurial expertise from the biotech and software backgrounds. We are currently patent pending and in our proof of concept prototype development phase. With $15,000, we will be able to accelerate this prototype development, most likely having a working device completed before this summer, um, which would then allow us to move on to the next phase of refinement and clinical trials. Thank you. Thank you. 
so this device looks like over time in terms of keeping it um, so clean and sanitary and can be used for Mm -hmm. Definitely. So our device can definitely be used on individuals. You know, that's the, the reason I had the idea in the first place is now instead of having to manually stick myself every day, I can just wrap this thing around and have it, have it done for me. Um, so there's the, the individuals who could buy the device or have their insurance companies buy the devices for them, um, which is more likely, which is people who require, who require daily infusions. Um, and it's small and portable, so I could have it in my backpack, I could go infuse in my dorm room and really just do it anywhere. Um, on the other hand, as I mentioned, there's tons of potential markets for institutions, such as hospitals or chemotherapy infusion centers in the back of ambulances, um, et cetera. So it could really do either. Um, and then for the second part about the maintenance is that the user's medication is never actually going through our device, and they're not the, the need, there's no needle in our device. So for the sterilization and for liability purposes, it's nothing is, is on us in terms of things that could really go wrong. Where for me as a hemophiliac, say I have my medication, I have my syringe, I have my needle, and I do everything the exact same as I normally would up into the exact point of when I would manually insert it into my arm, and instead of doing that, I just clip it into the device and have the device do it for you. Um, so the sterilization of, of you know, using alcohol to wipe down your arm and then the needle and all that, it's really up to the user as it would be normally. Device. Yeah, all it is is a guidance device just for intravenous injections, exactly. infused daily, what's the ballpark of that number of people in the US? Well, so for hemophiliacs alone, it's a relatively small $9 billion market. Um, there's around 20,000 hemophiliacs in the United States, as well as, you think, chemotherapy. If, uh, if you have cancer and you have to do chemotherapy, it might not be a home infusion setting where you sit in your living room and do it every day, but you do need these daily infusions. Um, and it's, it's the same for many other diseases, such as Crohn's, MS. Um, there's really patients in, in a lot of different areas that do require daily infusions. And where exactly are you guys in the patent process? So you said the patent is pending. Was it like, like submitted like yesterday? Has it been pending for like seven years? So, so we have the provisional and we're figuring out um, our deadlines coming up to either you know, file the non-provisional or decide what to do at that point. And you're not worried about the, your existing competitors. So I've seen a lot of companies um, that are kind of new to market who you know, your competitors have the data, they have the, you know, machinery already, they could make a smaller, more accessible version, right? So exactly. are you not worried about, you know, yeah. being disrupted? So I'm not because it's, it's fundamentally different. Where we do the vertical injection technology where the needle here is going straight down into the vein, which sounds crazy. You know, a human would never be able to do that or else you'd puncture the vein 100% of the time but it's crazy and we have technology that can do it. Or on the other hand, all the other devices are just big robotic claws that attempt to mimic how a nurse would infuse a vein laterally. Um, so we do have the IP over this vertical injection technology, which honestly before it was sort of the, I guess they just had a different mindset where they didn't even consider that this could be possible. First of all, uh, congratulations for, for taking a personal hardship and Thank you. having the drive to actually go try and solve it for other people, really admirable. Uh, in terms of the business model for this, is this a razor razor blade where you sell a piece of equipment and then you sell needles or some consumable that goes with it, or is it a straight up hardware sale? Yeah, so, so there's other revenue streams as well where we do need a custom needle for this. You can't just use a normal 32 gauge butterfly needle to go straight down because the bevels on these needles are, are too thick where they wouldn't you know, fit in a normal size vein. So we do have custom needles which we're making which would be, would be the replaceable constant sort of subscription, I guess, revenue stream coming in, um, as well as you know there could be uh, this is, we're kind of playing around with the idea of different customizable features for the device, such as for children, they could have a, a pink armband instead of a black one, or little fun things for hospital uses, versus it could be way different if it's in the back of an ambulance. Um, but yeah, so besides just the main hardware device, it is the, the constant custom needles will be needed as well. What is the insurance reimbursement on 
something like this? Um, I'm not. Is that possible? The insurance reimbursement, I think it is possible. I haven't looked into it extensively at this point because we're just focused on proving that this technology works. Mm -hmm. um, the, the tiny bit of research that I did do shows that, yes, it is, it is possible. Um, and another crazy part, which I actually wasn't able to mention in the presentation, is that this device is, is cost efficient for insurance companies. If, I, if my parents bought this device, when I was one year old, up to now, my insurance company would have saved so much money on me. I'm sorry, my parents wouldn't have bought it. It would be my insurance company that would buy it, adopting as the standard of care. Um, just because a huge issue is port cats where if you require daily infusions, you get a port a inserted. Um, and they get infected 40% of the time. I've had two in my life. Both have gotten infected. Both are so expensive. Because when you're a kid, your veins are so small, you can't, you know, people just can't hit a vein. Um, so you need to get these inserted where for hemophiliacs specifically, if you buy this device for your child right when they're born, your insurance company is going to save so much money on you over time. So, Miles, let me just make sure I got this right. So, the, the armband I wear, it's got optics that locate the optimal spot in the mm -hmm. vein. It has, it has the ability to figure out how far or how deep it needs to go. Mm -hmm. um, and it actually administers the drug, uh, so there's insertion through mm -hmm. the needle, and I put medicine into the arm band in order to yeah, so we just completely do not want to be liable for anything that would go wrong with the medication or the sterilization. So literally all the device is, and I don't know, it's, it's you, you can't really see it in this photo, but there's this little clip in the side. And literally all you do is you set up everything as you normally would on your own with your syringe, your needle, your medication, or if you're extracting blood with no medication, everything the exact same. The only thing that changes is the precise moment from when you're about to inject the vein, where you clip it into the device instead, it injects the vein for you, tells you that it's good, it's in the vein, and then the user is able to either infuse medication or extract blood at their own pace. It's, it's still manual with their syringe. The only thing that our device is doing is just removing the human air from this really dangerous process, honestly, of manually sticking the needle in your vein. So, so looking, looking forward from that statement, I might encourage you to try to think about how you can't use generic means, because the value proposition here may be the ways of like controlling of this. Mm -hmm. So to the extent that you somehow can figure out where they have to buy your needle to do this, yeah. may make your business model uh -huh. Yeah, well, they, they do have to use our needle. It would, be, it would be the normal syringe and medication, but a normal butterfly needle, for example, wouldn't work with our device because they're too big. Yeah. And this can be used for blood draws as well. Mm hmm. And, yeah. It can, it can be anywhere. Um, the, you know, the reason we had this cuff-like design is because most of the time people do infuse in their arms. Um, but you know, it could really, you know, you do your leg too if you hold it up there. Um, any, any place there's a vein, it'll be able to detect it and eject. Yeah, all right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.